And so when, season, when the season kicks off, everybody's already playing on the field. But before this season, what happens? We have the draft. We have the preseason. But before preseason, we have the draft. How many of you follow the draft? This is where it's like a big uh, game where all the teams come together and they select players. And we all know that if you're selected in the first round of the draft, you're really good, right? You're amazing. I mean, people go after you. They chase after you. And we're always looking at that show. It's, it's glamorous. People are picking the players. They're taking pictures. Then it's round two, round three, round four, round five. You're like, eh, these players aren't that great. Maybe somebody will find a, a, a diamond in, in that, you know, but I'm not sure. Really, everybody looks to the first draft, first round pa- uh, picks. And then you get to the undrafted. These are people who aren't even good enough for teams to really go after during the draft. And some of them, as you know, actually turn out to be better than the first round pick. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter when the lights are off, when the show is over, all that really matters is what happens on the field. Who plays, who plays well, who doesn't play well. And we all hear about this at the end of the season, right? There's a lot of busts out there. People who were picked in the first rounds in the very beginning thought that they were the best, and they turned out to be not that great. But we all have a way to judge people, entertainment, churches, government officials as election day draws near, and we all have our tier one, tier two, tier three. And there's a power struggle between these tiers. In the days of the early church, the book of Acts as we're going through that, something similar was happening there came this group of people who claimed to be the the followers of this Jesus, this Messiah that claimed to be the one God promised to save the world. But the problem is he didn't look like a first round pick. He didn't look like the Messiah because at the end of his journey, he ended up being crucified on a cross. And then his followers claimed that he was ascended to heaven. And now that they were supposed to uh, carry out his mission carry out his message of salvation. And here's the problem. They were talking about a new system of being with one another. These new Christians, as we were going through Acts, were disrupting the status quo, the social fabric of the time. You see, during the social fabric of that time, you had the very rich and very powerful Romans, and then you had all of their subsidiaries, all the people that they ruled, all the lands that they conquered, And within those conquered lands, you had a second tier and a third tier, and then you had the slaves, and everybody did their own thing. You had your place in that society. You were either rich or you were poor. You were either powerful or not powerful. You were either worthy or unworthy. And the ones who were in power at the first top level and even at the secondary level, meaning the countries they overtook, they would place their own leaders, that country's. So for the Jewish people, they have their own leaders that the Romans installed. And so here come these group of undrafted Christians, I call them, who were nothing, who were fishermen, who were kind of poor, who weren't the scholars, who weren't that great. And they came and they said this that screwed up this entire system of power. They said, everyone is worth it. Everyone has value. From the poor to the rich, we're equal in Christ. There's no male or female, nor Greek, nor Jew, Gentile. We are all the same in God. Everybody has value. Now, you think, well, that's great. That sounds very American. Democracy. But it wasn't safe for the ones in power because all of a sudden, they felt a little bit threatened. And what we'd see in Acts is we have this small group of people in Acts chapter 1 and 2. There's about 120 of them. And as they're proclaiming this message of freedom, that in Jesus we're all equal, we're all valid, that we all have a place in God's story, all of a sudden this group of people exploded onto the scene. They were accompanied by miracles and powerful works of God, and they went from 120 people to like 10,000 people in a matter of a short time frame. And when they were still small, they had appeared in front of what we call the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish council. This is like their superior court. And when they were small, the council, made up of Jewish leaders, different political parties, said, do not talk about the name of Jesus. And they said, sorry, we can't listen to you. And at first it was okay, but when it grew from 120 to 10,000, the Jews took notice. 
And we talked about it last week. Peter talked about it. It went from just primarily being Jewish people to Jewish people plus other cultures and traditions with Jewish backgrounds. All of a sudden, not only were they being threatened by the Jewish people, they were threatened by a whole host of people, and they couldn't have this anymore. It was Jews plus the Hellenists plus the Greeks. This was going out of control because this new faith was inclusive of other people. And so Stephen, this character that we're going to read about, this new member, this new leader, a Greek background in this Jewish church, is having conversation with other people who are actually being threatened by this new system because they might lose power, and they start arguing with him, and we see how the word of God spreads. So this is the story that we're diving into today, and it's recorded in Acts chapter 6, and I'm going to read verses 8 through 15. And we're going to take out a couple of lessons for our own life of how to treat other people and how to live a life that models Jesus and inclusivity and love for others. So here's how the story goes. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Syrians and the Alexandrians and of those from Cilicia and Asia rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. This is the third time an apostle is in front of the council in the book of Acts. And they set up false witnesses and said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in this council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. It's interesting. So Stephen is proclaiming the love of Jesus. He's saying that, hey, guess what? Everybody has access to God. And so these men start arguing with Stephen. They can't win the argument, so what do they do? They make up false accusations. Sounds familiar? This is the same thing that happened to Jesus when Jesus was in front of the same council. They made up false accusations. This man says that he hates this temple. It's like standing in front of the U.S. Supreme Court with the copy of the original Constitution and burning it. You'd be like, whoa, that's the most sacred thing we have. How'd you get the original copy out of the safe? Right? This is what they're saying. These men say that this temple doesn't matter. The most sacred thing for the Jewish people was their temple. They actually believe that God was literally right there. That this geographical temple, this place with all the enormous decorations and the gold and everything they had, was the place God is speaking. And here come these fellas, these undrafted rookies, who say it does matter. God can work out here too. They're like, wait, wait, wait. No, God only works in our house. When we control God, when we say how you access God, if we give that up, we have no power. God only speaks in the temple. God only speaks right here. Have you ever heard something similar in culture? This is the only way to believe in God, right? We heard these statements. God can't work out there. You think God's working with those people? Do you know what they've been doing? They don't even know the church songs. They don't know Hillsong. <laughs> How can they? God's not there. This is the dilemma. This was the argument that God only works in a particular place. He's bound to this box. And so here's what they say. This man, Stephen, speaks against this place, and God only speaks here. God only works here. And so they get Stephen and say, is this true? Did you really say that the temple and our customs and our traditions don't matter? And Stephen looks at them and he says, you know what? Are you, are you kidding me? Do you guys not know your own history? But let me recap. And so he goes into this, I think it's like 58 verses. I'm not going to read the whole story, just pieces of it. But he goes through this bucket list of their greatest heroes through their history. And he points something out, that God is working somewhere other than the temple. I call this, this like the Jewish Avengers list. I mean, these are all the superheroes, right? I looked up Avengers on Wikipedia today because I didn't know all the Avengers. I know Iron Man's in there. Like, who else is in the Avengers? Captain America, Hulk, right? Oh, I can't, I can't even, I mean, when I was like 12, 10 years ago, whatever it was, 20 years ago, I started watching like Spider-Man and then I lost track. They keep adding new heroes. They keep, add, they mix them all up. How many of you still watch that stuff? Like three people. Good for you, yeah. 
Uh, if you know, if you can untangle the, the web of the Avengers, let me know after service. But this is what he does. These are the Jewish greatest heroes. These are the people they hold in highest esteem. And so Stephen's like, let me show you that you're wrong. Not because I say you're wrong, but because your own history shows this. And so he goes through this list and he starts with their most important, the father of the faith, which is Abraham. How many of you have heard about Abraham? Raise a hand. Who's heard of Abraham? He's like, all right, cool. Abraham, the father of our faith. Let's take a look at him. And here's what he says. Acts 7, 1 through 4. And the high priest said, are these things so? And Stephen said, brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. Before he lived in Haran and said to him, go out from your land and from your kindred and go into this land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. So quick question, what is God doing here? What is he doing with regards to Abraham? He's speaking, right? God is speaking to Abraham. Is he speaking to Abraham in the temple? No temple. Hmm. Is it in Jerusalem? Nope. He's like, look, our, fa- our own father, when God spoke to him, he wasn't in Jerusalem. In fact, this place didn't even exist. God speaks everywhere. You want to continue, he says? So he says, what about Joseph? Verses 7 through 9. And then he goes through this history, and I'm going to summarize it. He says, And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, so this is years later, sold him to Egypt, but God was with him and rescued him out of all of his afflictions and gave him favor before Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, who made him ruler over all of the household. What is happening here? God is speaking to who? To Joseph. He's speaking, he's blessing, he's rescuing. Is he in the temple? No. Where is God speaking? In Jerusalem? No, in Egypt. All right, and then he goes to this history, the history of the Jews. They were enslaved for 400 years, and then comes Moses. Moses was regarded as this great prophet in the Jewish faith. And he's like, look at Moses. At this time, Acts 7.20, Moses was born, and he was beautiful. I had to pause there because I've never heard someone being talked about as beautiful in the Bible. I thought, I hope God thinks I'm beautiful. (laughs) So that's why I put this verse up here. Moses was beautiful in God's sight. And so he was in his father's house. Now, when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness. So he goes through the whole history of Moses growing up in Egypt, being cast out after he stood up for a Jewish man. You guys know the story if you watch the Prince of Egypt. And then God shows up to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame and a fire of a bush. And then Moses sees this. He's amazed at the sight. He comes near. And here we have God talking through grass. Think about Stephen sitting right there with all the 60 plus members of the council and he's like, you claim God can only speak here. Don't you remember God talked through Moses through a bush in some weird desert? No temple, none of your power, none of your rules and regulations, none of all of these burdens that you put on people when you say you must worship this way, you must believe in this way. If you don't believe this portion of this theory about this theology, about this piece of creation, about this, you know how we have it today and all these systems and dominations, they just layer burden upon burden upon burden upon burden and the people from the outside who don't have much experience with the church, they go, I think I have enough code in the law in the city of Spokane. I don't need to deal with another layer of rules. There's no freedom in this. And so Moses, here he is, he's talking to God. God sends him to Egypt. God is speaking. Is there a temple? No. So what's the pattern? The first pattern is God is speaking through whatever he wants, not in a temple. But number two, he says you. Then he goes through this history. You can read this in chapter seven yourself today. When Moses takes the people out of Egypt, after all the miracles, after all of the signs, after the Red Sea opened up, Moses goes for 40 days and 40 nights into the mountain to pray with God. And the people abandon him and say, where is he? And they make a golden calf. They start to idolize making idolatry because they're like, we don't see this God. People fall really quickly because they want customs and traditions. People like to have religion. People love religion. Religion is a multi-billion dollar industry, people. It really is. You know why? Because it's very, very easy to say, you know what? You're the holy man. You know, you're the pastor. Tell me what to do. I will do these things and then I go to heaven. That's far easier than I have to think about this. I have to be in a relationship with other people. I actually have to freaking practice generosity and love and open my heart. That's a lot harder 
then I go to church, I go through these customs, and they tell me I'm okay, so I'm okay. And unfortunately, we pay money for that first model. Like, yep, just tell me what to do and make it easy, super easy. Don't make it complicated, and I'll pay my tithe. And, 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 and Stephen's like, no, 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 God is much more creative than your box. And thank God for that. Thank God for, thank God for him being more creative than what we give him credit for. Because he works in much different ways than we think. Then he goes on, finally, he's like, finally there's David, Acts 7, 45 through 47. He's like, our fathers, in turn, brought it with Joshua, this tent of the meeting. Um, so it was until the days of David, who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a dwelling place. We're finally getting to the temple. But Solomon built the house. So finally, God is speaking to David. Where? Not in Jerusalem. There is no temple. Finally, his son Solomon builds the temple. Here we are, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later, finally they build a box It's called the temple. Here it is. The box that these leaders talking to Stephen say is the only place God speaks, only via their rules and regulations. Finally, it's there. And what does uh, Stephen say? Remember, God looks at this box and he says, yeah, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hands make these things? Even when people finally built a box for God, God's like, you know I can't fit in that. <laughs> you do know that this is silly. Now, here's the thing. We're humans. We need boxes. We all need boxes. This is why we have our notes and our little checklists on the fridge and, oh, did you forget to buy the milk? How dare you? The eggs. We need boxes because humans, we're limited. We're not all seen like God, so we need boxes. So God's like, fine, build a box. That's great. There's nothing wrong with boxes. Let me say that. I'm not riling against, I'm not one of those emergent churches theology people. Tear down all structure. What do you have after that? I don't know. We just burn it to the ground. No, structure's good. Boxes are good. We all love culture. We all love things. Some of you like the NFL. Some of you don't. Some of you watch uh, football, and some of you watch football, where they throw that lemon-looking thing with brown, you know, that one. It's just different, and we need our boxes, but here's the problem. When we say the box is God, or you can only experience God this way, that's when we get into trouble. When we say only in our church, only in our denomination, only with these types of people, only in these types of traditions can you experience God, this is when we start getting into trouble. Instead of saying, this is the way I worship, and there are basic beliefs that we all share, but cultural things can change over time, we actually put up barriers for other people who are looking for a relationship with God to see God for who he is. So here's our first takeaway. God works outside of our boxes. He can speak to anyone anywhere. And this is both relieving, exciting, and kind of scary. So maybe you've been told your whole life you're not good enough for the church. You don't have a perfect record. The rap sheet you have with the police ain't great. <laughs> maybe you're a different faith. Maybe you're Muslim or a Buddhist or agnostic, or maybe you're of a different persuasion, or maybe you're straight or gay, or maybe you're whatever, and somebody's telling you, you can't actually have a relationship with God because you're not fitting our box. I think what this chapter says is, uh, no, actually, God can work and speak to anybody anywhere, regardless of who they are. God can work with anybody. Now, when we come into relationship with God, there is hope that God changes who we are into who he is, but how he does that can be a little bit different for different people. And so we as a church have to be very careful that while we have our customs and traditions, we don't make them the thing that we're following. Amen? We need to follow Jesus, not our customs. And sometimes our customs are great and they can facilitate that, but sometimes things change and we have to change, not because we don't like our customs, not like we don't like to do what we do, but because we love people more than what we're into. We gotta love people more than what we're into. Um, this week I was having a, a, um, a get-together with a friend this person's not necessarily in the church, and, and they were telling me their church experience. And it was really interesting. We got off, I don't know how we started talking about church, but she was telling me, hey, you know, I don't necessarily go to church, or I have in the past, but when I started hanging out with my husband, who was a Christian, they told me that I couldn't be with him, he couldn't be with me, because I was a heathen. Like, I wasn't necessarily in the faith. And, 
that really struck a weird nerve with me. Like she was told, you can't be part of this church because you're not technically a member of this denomination or, or whatever. I'm like, this is so weird because this person, as I know this person now, is a phenomenal member of our community. She's doing great things. She's contributing to the community through the arts and she's just is creating such a great impact. And now she is a believer. But I was just so saddened to hear that at the beginning when she was kind of just interacting with somebody from the church, she was told that, well, you're not necessarily fitting our criteria. Therefore, we don't like it. And I thought about it. How many of us accidentally do that to other people? How many times do we push people away because of our preconceived notions of who God can talk to and where God can talk? I'm guilty of it. I'm very easily offended by people who don't believe like me sometimes. And this scripture says, hey, time out. God might be doing something that you don't even know. And if we stop doing this, if we stop judging or prejudging people, we're going to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. But if we continue to prejudge people, what can actually happen, and we'll see this in the story, is that we can start to resist the work of the Holy Spirit. Church, we have to be careful not to resist what God is doing the church is life-giving, but only because God gave us that life. We don't own life that God gave us. And so God can speak to anybody, and when people like us come together, we're called the church. But remember that salvation comes from God. The church is just the result of what God is doing, stirring hearts, inviting people to repentance and faith. But we're not the source of that life. And if we confuse the two, we're going to put barriers to people's way to God. The best we can do as a collective is pray and say, God, where is your spirit moving and how do I partner with what you're already doing in the community? God, how can I make it all about you, not about me? God, maybe you're speaking to somebody else differently than me. Maybe the way I experienced you, know how I came to Christ? We're at some big event, at some youth conference, there was an altar call, I came to the front, that was great. Not everybody experiences that, and not everybody has any feelings. Some people gradually, over time, come to faith through interaction, and sometimes we have to give that a lot of weight and say, look, God can do it differently. If you come from the Slavic culture, you might have experienced this, where in your old church you were told that you can only experience God if you go to church at these times, and you dress like this, and pray like this, and listen to only this type of music. And we do that because we all have a commonality in culture. But church, if tomorrow God calls us to a different cultural group to minister to somebody who is very different than us at Pacific Keep Church, and the Spirit challenges us to change things, guess what? We're going to change things at Pacific Keep Church. We're going to change things at Pacific Keep Church because we want to follow the Spirit. We don't want to resist what God is doing. As soon as you start to codify and make your box or your religion or your domination the main thing, faith dies and religion is born. Faith dies and religion and regulation is born. Faith becomes transactional, like I said before. God, you give me Y if I do X. I say, sing the, wrong, the right songs, I go to church, and all of a sudden, faith becomes very easy. And we know that ourselves, we've been guilty of this, and we've seen people who say faith is super easy because really quickly, they can take somebody else and say, well, this person doesn't meet my criteria, therefore they're whatever, not going to heaven, they're not saved. A Sunday school teacher was teaching a class and she was talking about how you can't be saved by works and so the students knew this, of course, they were five-year-olds and she said, so students, if I went and I sold all of my property and gave all the proceeds to church, would I make it to heaven? Would that give me credit for heaven? And the kids are like, no, you can't be saved by works. She's like, fine, well, what if I quit my job and I went to work for the church and I mowed the lawn and I poured everything I have into the church? Would I go to heaven? Would I earn my right to go to heaven? And the kid's are like, no, no, you wouldn't. And so she finally asked, well, then how do I get to heaven? And, and a five-year-old kid in the back says, well, you first got to be dead. <laughs> it's true, Right. This is the culture we live in. This is what we've trans This is what we've taken the greatest faith of God coming in the flesh, living as Jesus as a carpenter's son for 30 years, pooping in a diaper, as one of my professors said, being and taking part of everything that's beautiful about life, the richness, going through suffering, experiencing life with people, and we've converted all of that richness and vibrancy and interaction to before you die, say this prayer. 
And then we skip over life and say, well, as long as I'm good when I die. That's such a hollow and colorless way to live life. Jesus says, I have come to give you life, life with fullness if you follow the Spirit. Because it's also about what happens when we die, yes. But what we expect in the future, which is resurrection, we expect to be resurrected. And we sing the songs in heaven, there will be no tears and no more suffering. But we get to bring that reality into a broken world today. This is the job of the church. And that is a lot harder, like I said, to do. Because our eyes first have to be open to what's broken. And then our obedience to Christ must be such that we say yes to God to fix that through the spiritual gifts that we are given. This is not the typical message you get in church. That we're co-workers with Christ in the resurrection and restoration of all things, whether it's the environment, whether it's social justice, whether it's our neighborhoods, whether it's our school, whether it's the city streets that we all walk on and live in, we are called to be a resurrected people, not just thinking about when we die, we go to heaven. But so much, our, so much of our religion is that. And what happens is we actually miss what God is doing amongst us. This is what Stephen said at the end of his speech you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, which is Jesus, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by the angels and did not keep it. So takeaway two is this. Let's not resist the Holy Spirit. God works inside and outside of our church. He works on the inside and on the outside of our church. Be on the lookout. Be on the lookout. What is God doing in my community? And if, if we change our perspective and we're on the lookout, you know what can happen? The people that we think are our enemies, the people that we think mm, they're not like us, they don't fit our boxes, we might be surprised that they could become co-workers and co-partners in the gospel. And so this is how the story ends. It's kind of unfortunate, but it's also very interesting of what happens. Acts 54 through 60, chapter 7. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Can you imagine? They're hearing this awesome news that God is transforming the world outside of Jerusalem. And all they hear is, our power is going away. I don't want to hear it. I'm losing relevance. I'm going to not have the power and the money. I hate this. I mean, literally, people who are blind are seeing, people who are lame are walking, uh, 10,000 people who had no faith are now having faith in Jesus. And all of the religious leaders, all they can think of is like, give me my seat of power. Do not touch my mansion. Don't touch my 401k. Do not start anything because the Romans might take the power away from me. This is a selfish leadership. These were the people that were in charge of actually bringing people to God. And here they are actually pushing God away. And so they cried out with a loud voice. They rushed at him. They cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. We'll get back to that. I don't think he fell asleep, but he did. You know, I feel called to say this, especially two days before the election. In today's political climate, uh, we are bombarded by messages of us versus them. If you have values, whatever they are, in this world, in the political world, the only way to win is to defeat the other side by putting your people into power. And I get that. I think as individuals, we all have a right to vote, and that's everybody's right, and I think it's great if we do. 
But I think when we take the same mentality of we have to beat them through power and we say, fine, in the political world, I get that. Everybody has free speech, we can vote. But when we take that same idea and concept and say that's how we have to fight Christian battles and Christian values, what happens is we're actually going against what Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount, which is turn the other cheek. And it actually doesn't give the result that we want. And so I think we have to be very careful. On the one hand, as an American, I think voting is great. On the other hand, as a Christian, my allegiance is to the gospel. And the way we show power is through powerlessness as Christians. And the reason I bring that up is I think if we carry this framework, we have to beat the other side, whether it's politics or religion or anything else, into our faith, what happens is we actually reject this idea that God, like we said, can work with anyone anywhere. Because let's be honest, if we are serious about the fact that God can work anywhere with anyone, then we must hold out the possibility that the person who is my enemy could be my friend one day, right? That God could change that person. And the Christian way is to actually extend love, patience, and sacrifice to the other. So our reaction to those who oppose us should be modeled after Jesus. This is what Stephen did. His reaction to people who hated him, who were literally throwing stones in his face, was what? He prayed the same exact prayer that Jesus prayed on the cross when he was being sacrificed and crucified. Lord, forgive them and don't hold this against them. This isn't their fault. They're unaware of what they're doing. So please, please forgive them. This sounds a lot like Jesus. And here's the irony. Luke does this incredible thing of foreshadowing. As Stephen is praying for these group of people, as they're dragging him to the cliffside to throw stones at him, it's getting a little bit hot outside. So they're taking off their outer garments because, you know, when you stone people, it gets hot. And so they're taking off their garments and like, hey, they're kind of expensive garments. Can we put him with you, young sir, this man named Saul? Watch our clothes while we go kill this guy. So as this guy is watching their expensive clothing because it's too hot to stone people with this coat on from Helly Hansen, wherever he was, they're throwing stones at Stephen and he's looking at this whole thing and he's like, Lord, I invite you into this midst of my enemies. Come here. Be here. Forgive all of them. Even in the most hardest, most painful Moment of his life, he's inviting God into the midst inside. God, be right here in this trouble. He was looking at his enemies through the lens of resurrection. When all things are made new, God is going to save everybody. That's what he believes because we believe everybody can be saved. So he's praying, Lord, through the lens of the resurrection, I want good for these people. Little did he know that this man who was watching the clothing was named as Saul in a few short days or I don't know, months, he would be on his way to Damascus. This is St. Paul. And he would be hit with the light of the resurrection. This young man would actually become the vessel God would use to spread the gospel to the end of the world. Little did Stephen know that 2,000 years later, all of us would be sitting here at the Bean Crosby Theater reading the letters of St. Paul, this guy watching his clothes, the clothes of the men beating him and stoning him to death, and we would grow in faith because of the letters this man wrote. That's crazy to me. That he didn't even see what would happen, but he trusted that God can use anybody, anywhere to change the world. And that's our takeaway three. God can use the least likely people or person to change the world. So we must treat everyone, even our enemies, like they're the next Billy Graham. Or Oprah or whatever. We must treat everybody like they have the seed of God's love in them and it can grow. This is the hope that we have in everybody. So Christians cannot use the rules of engagement from this world to clobber our enemies. We have to give up our rights and let people, even if we get nothing, even if we get stoned in the process or we get hurt in the process, we have to hold out hope that God is doing something right there and we have to invite God into this situation. This week, I, uh, well, a couple weeks ago, I resigned from my job at the city, and this was the last week that I was at work, and it was a week of goodbyes. I had lunch and coffee with a whole lot of friends and leaders, and I was having lunch with this man 
who's a leader. He's done some great things for the city. I won't name his name. But, and we were talking about what I'm doing. And so what's been really interesting is as I'm explaining what I'm doing, I have to talk about the church and what we're doing and all. I turned into this opportunity to witness to all of these people. Like, what? You're leaving to do what? Oh, okay, church. Great. Uh, and, and this particular person, we had this interesting conversation. And he's like, you know what? He's like, you would think church is a place where everybody is welcome. He's saying this to me. You would think church is a place where it's about the corporate good of everybody, not the individualism that plagues our society today at the expense of others. You would think church is a place where even if we don't agree, we can still be loved. And then he said, but unfortunately it isn't. And he said, but that's what people want. And this is a guy that doesn't go to church. And I thought about it and I said, yeah. I said, that's why I'm going to go work for the church. I want to make it that. We want to make it that. But to me, you know, we get in our little cocoon when we talk to churchy people with churchy language. It's interesting to hear from the outside. People actually crave what the church is supposed to be. Church, let's be the church. Let's stop treating people who are against our values as our enemies. Let's start praying for them and seeing them as our friends and seeing them as part of God's grand plan, even if we don't see the result in our life. Today we're going to take communion. Right now we're going to take communion. And communion is just a reminder. What model we want to live. The bread represents the body of Christ which was broken for our sins. And oftentimes the life of a Christian is a life of being broken. Of wanting to lash out against our enemies but not in feeling pain. And the wine and the juice represents the blood of Jesus. His blood was spilled. This is the sacrificial love that God showed us. And so as we take, I'm going to invite you all to stand with us. Lord, we hold these signs with open arms and open hands. Lord, help us be peacemakers. Lord, as we take these signs as a model of a reminder of what you did, you left your position of power, became powerless, and through it you changed the world. Help us seek to love everybody, including those who we might consider in the opposition. As we go out and participate in democracy this week, Lord, we also pray that we, we exercise our rights, but do it in a way with, that's filled with grace, that we see all people as humans loved by you. Let us these signs be the main way we live life, not a secondary thing that we just delegate to Sunday. We pray for the power of your Holy Spirit to go before us, to change our lives, and to lead us into the future. In the name of Jesus, we pray these, and we take these gifts with open and thankful hearts. Amen.